Hey everybody, this is Dr. Ben Pearl. Today I am here with a legend, Dr. Howard Dannenberg. People know him mainly for his uh, Halix Limitus discussion, his thoughts and his contributions to running shoes, and also just some of the general biomechanics contributions he's made to the field of podiatry. Welcome, Howard. Thank you. Nice to see you. So I understand you went to Ohio uh, for podiatry school. Mm -hmm. You had a seminal article in, was it 86, 1986 in JAMA? 1986 was my first JAPMA article on functional hallux luminous. I think it was functional hallux luminous and its effect on gait efficiency. Yeah. And then more generally, you've talked about the importance of the sagittal plane, which is, I think, a big thing that's been discussed over the past few years. So many times people overemphasize the frontal and looking at the back of a, a treadmill. Give me your thoughts. Let's start general on some of the things that you think are important over your years with gait analysis. Well, you know, I mean, podiatrists have, because of limitations in offices, have had to watch people walk in hallways. So you see the front and you see the back. And that was the view. But when you start to look at ranges of motion and what happens during the gait cycle, Sagittal plane is probably 70% of more of what happens. The transverse frontal is 25, 30% maybe. I mean, it's like, so if you don't look from the side, you miss the vast majority of what's happening during walking. And I think that that has led podiatrists to conclude that what they see is what's happening instead of not realizing how much they're actually missing when not looking from the side. I built a gate lab in my office early on as I began to understand this more and more and use videos to watch people walk, particularly from head on the back and from the side and started to real. that was before you can record on an iPhone too. That was, you know, video, video tapes, but the side view was amazing. And it really started me to think about a lot of other things, um, including the effect of feet on head and neck position, shoulder position, how much hip extension occurred during walking. So those issues become very important. What were those some of the things you picked up about the influence on the lumbar and vice versa to gait? Because I know that there's a lot, been yeah. a lot of discussion about that. Yeah, there certainly is. It is so um, what I, in, um, I think in 2001, I published a paper at the World Congress in Back Pain where I did a study on patients uh, before and after wearing foot orthotics um, designed to treat functional hallux luminous and enhance sagittal plane motion. And what we saw in low back pain patients was that the effect doubled the amount of hip extension that, they, that happened during single support phase. So that when patients walked, they, the stride length was much longer when you treated the ability of the toe joints to dorsiflex versus not. And interestingly enough, I mean, my thesis on back pain has a lot to do with how swing phase initiates. And I don't mean the first step, I mean, as it initiates during the course of walking. So you stride and you get, it, and, and, it, and you extend the hip through the end of single support phase. The more it extends, the more preload it has to then reverse, because once single support ends and double support begins, extension reverses to flexion. The less flex, the less extension there is, the less ability you have to, to speed pre-swing phase during walking. And so what happens is, and since the muscles that fire at that time originate from the lumbar spine, the iliopsoas, the iliacus, those come from the iliac crest and the lumbar spine directly from the discs and from the intervertebral septum. And so if you don't have adequate speed of acceleration into flexion, those muscles have to overwork to accelerate that process. Where would it hurt? Right in the low back. And so it, my, my contention has been that we're looking, we look at pounding and other pronation and other issues, but in fact, it's the ability to extend the hip I also published my outcomes in low back pain. I published a study in um, 1999 on, on outcomes in chronic low back pain patients considered at medical endpoint. And we followed them for over a year. I think it was 13.9 months on average. And what we found 
that we had an 84% cure rate in patients considered at medical endpoint by using foot orthotics and by doing some lower extraordinary manipulation as well. It's great stuff, and it's stuff that we all experience in our practices. And it's sure. too bad that, like, for instance, the Veterans Hospital has a total disassociation. And some of that you have to expect it's because there'd be so many claims, you know, related to things that happen to people's feet in the Army and, yeah. and infantry, yeah. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So let's take it back down to the foot again. You had uh, a lot of uh, work with the windless effect. Um, tell me a little bit about that, its influence with hal functional hallux limitus and some of the other things that you think are related to the windless effect. Well, um, I think that, um, that during walking, I mean, Hicks described the windless in 1954. And he said that once it starts, that was a journal of anatomy, once it starts, it's irresistible. You can't reverse it. It, it, it. Once it starts, and not only does it raise the arch, but it also externally rotates the lower limb, which is nice because that's got to match the upper thigh external rotation as the opposite leg swings forward. Swing phase is instinctive in humans. It's a really critical part to understand the gait cycle. Um, and when, when you walk, you actually... You don't push with the calf muscle. That's absolutely wrong. What you do is you pull with the swing limb. I mean, think about it, and your audience might want to try this. So stand up and walk backwards. And the first thing you do is you step backwards. If I asked you to move to the left or move to the right, you'd step in the direction you're moving. You don't abduct your hip on one side to move you to the other. What you do is you imbalance your center of gravity, use your body weight, to drive the limb and use it as a lever. Well, forward walking is the same thing. So, and, and if you even look at the, the, the muscle function in the hip joint, for instance, during walking, that the glutes fire at heel strike. And by the time you reach the middle of the step, when your body is centered over your foot, the glutes shut off. Completely, they shut off. So hip extension from that point to the end of single support phase is non-muscular. The muscles that extend the hip are shut down. So what happens is that you're actually pulling yourself and you pull your body forward, you lift it up and then it falls down. So gravity is what's the prime mover of the body. The muscles of the lower extremity function eccentrically. They resist motion. So what they do is they stay, it's much more efficient, it's like six times more efficient. So what they do is they stabilize the limb as you're stepping over it and allow you to thrust against the ground. That's how you walk. And that's the critical component in understanding gait and what happens and where all these issues come from. Well, Harry described the three-part rocker system in the foot, where the round underside of the heel is the first rocker, and that brings you down to foot flat. Then the ankle dorsiflexes about 10 degrees over the foot. That gives you the second rocker. And the third rocker is the MTP joints. MTP joints are fascinating. They're exclusively human. Uh, monkeys have atavistic thumbs like hands. They don't, you can't dorsiflex your thumb on your hand because it's opposing joint. Feet don't do that anymore. And as we evolved and as that changed, what happened is it allowed us to stride longer than the length of our limbs. And that made us sufficient because now you can lift your heel off the ground while still maintaining ground contact during the course of any single step. And so as you stride and step forward, what happens is that you rise your heel off the ground and you activate the windlass. That causes the arch to raise and that causes the lower limb to externally rotate, matching it to the rotation from above caused by the opposite limb. And that's my contention has been for that for a very long time, that are we seeing excessive pronation or are we seeing failure to resupinate because the windlass doesn't work because the NTP joint doesn't dorsiflex. Bring in, bring in your concepts of perineal inhibition and functional hallux limitus into that model that you just ex described. Um, so it's the perineus longus that courses down the lateral side of the leg, comes under the cuboid, courses across the foot and inserts into the base of the first metatarsal, first cuneiform joint. It everts and plantar flexes or resists more, more appropriately, it resists dorsiflexion inversion of the first ray during walking. So it maintains its stability against the ground. That's what allows for the, to hold the first ray against the ground 
so that as the heel rises, the MTP joints will dorsiflex. In Hallux Liminus, Hallux Valgus, and a variety of other issues associated with the first ray, perineal inhibition, which is the opposite of facilitation, it's when the muscle acts weak versus acts strong, um, can't stabilize the ray against the ground, you get first metatarsal dorsiflexion and jamming across the MTP joint. One of two things are going to happen. You're going to jam the joint and eventually get osteoarthritis in it, lead to hallux levinus, hallux rigidus, or you're going to avoid it, and you can avoid it habitually. The first case that I ever identified functional hallux levinus in was a woman who came in to see me with 40 years of anterior lateral leg pain on one side. Every night, not during the day, only at night, she'd sit and the leg would throb and throb and throb and throb. I was the 13th doctor she saw. I had gotten an electrodynogram from Langer at the time, and I didn't really understand what it meant, but I was using it, and she came in. And I did a test on her, and the first test, her hallux had four times her body weight, and the second test, Test, test the hallux didn't touch the ground. All the weight was on second step. All the weight was on the lateral side of the foot. Next step, the hallux had four times the body weight. Next step, all the weight was on the lateral side of the foot. So my first thought was the machine was broken because how could that be? I mean, that makes no sense. But then I watched her. And every other step, you could see her anterior tibial muscle fire and rotate her to the lateral side of her foot. And I'm thinking she has no complaint of first MT, MTP joint pain. She's got no complaints in her feet at all. It's her leg. So I'm thinking, it's like, it's like she's avoiding it. Well, let's call the lock maneuver. I knew that that was hallux luminous. And people did that, but she hasn't had any symptoms. Why would somebody compensate for something that doesn't hurt them? And that was my, as I drove home that day, I, that's what I thought. It's like, why would that happen? The next day, every pronating patient I looked at had that. I mean, I tested their NTP joint range of motion, and it was as soon as you loaded it, it would lock. And it was like, uh oh, what does this mean? I mean, this was like 1984, 83, something like that. And, and I, I was like, what does this mean? I mean, what is this about? And that really led me on my life's work. Tell us about um, your invention. Uh, you, you had a novel idea that uh, got picked up in Brooks Shoes. You're one of the one of the few podiatrists that had something implemented in a major running shoe, you and uh, Dr. Rob Roy McGregor with his yep. uh, kinetic wedge free tonic. Tell us yep. how that came about and how, yep. well, and, and I'd also like to know in the same, same idea, how it's different in the orthotics, your kinetic wedge and, and how it was a little different implemented in the, in the Brooks running shoe. Well, well, let, me, let me talk about Rob Roy McGregor, who was a real favorite person of mine. He's deceased now. He was a great guy. And he gave me an incredible piece of advice very early on in my career. I mean, I've known him for, I knew him for a very, very long time. Great guy. And he said, no one, because I had a decision to make about what I was going to do with something. And, and he said, no one advance, you'll never look back. That once you make your decision, you'll work as hard as you can to make that the right decision. And that's the direction you're going to go in. Well, he was right. And I've used that advice for the rest of my life. And, and it was wonderful. So I have a lot of respect for Rob Roy. Rob's invention was not the kinetic wedge. It was a heel piece. It was a heel cup that sat right. in the back of a tonic shoes. Um, mine was very different because it was um, it was the idea that, that first MTP joint dorsiflexion became very important. And I had... Um, I, I eventually got picked up by Brooks through a lot of, you know, persistence and hard work, but it was worthwhile. And they implemented the kinetic wedge in their shoes from 1986 until 1992, which is a six year run, which in the shoe business is a very, very long time and a lifetime almost. And it was good. Um, since then, I have learned how to do much better um, mobilizations of the first metatarsal using a variety of different types of shapes of depressions under the first metatarsal head that allows it to plan effects and evert that's sold under the, um, a, uh, a label called uh, Insolia, which we make products that make high heel shoes more comfortable. We make products that make walking more comfortable. We can sh we've shown many times how um, 
when you walk with this in your shoe, your stride length increases, you stand straighter, you walk faster. Uh, all with, with less energy. So um, it's pretty interesting stuff. And uh, But it, it's very refined. And we do that work on CAD now and, and can do very subtle, incredible changes to shoe and soles to make that all work. Those are commercial products that are for sale around the world. We sold millions of them already. I will tell you that I suffer from turf toe and, and functional hallux limitus. Just getting stomped on my my left MTP uh, from other soccer players, and then playing on turf yeah. primarily, right? We don't play a lot on grass, and I find uh, that even uh, a semi-functional, not full rigid um, EVA orthosis. I'll show you what I what I wear in my yeah. fleet. Just even something like this. This is a. I have no stake in this company this is just yeah. out of uh, new yeah. zealand turn it, but even see something the, like let, this let me see the got, top of it let me see the top of it yeah it's a little beat up but yep yeah that's okay yeah. um yeah uh, a little more first rate cutout would help you a lot right out <laughs> the bottom and the other thing i would suggest well it, it has worn yeah because well, of pressure. Sure it does because you want to try to have it. an auto created depression a little bit what you should do is grind out the cleat under the first metatarsal head we did that. I started doing that with little league players in the town where I worked, and eventually, and one of the coaches was a uh, was an anesthesiologist at the hospital we worked in, and he liked the idea so much he did it to all the team players, and he just put the, with a grinding wheel, just grind out that one clean, not under the toe, under the metatarsal head, let it from the flexion. external, from the external, from the internal, from, from the, the external. external. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those cleats press right up. And they prevent you from plantar flexing. I actually have, I just, we, um, we had a patent, I believe it's issued um, for, um, for a design for cleats to alleviate that problem. There's a lot more to that too. Um, I think a lot of the cleat designs um, are part of the process of non-contact ACL injuries. And when you watch them carefully and you watch them in slow motion when they happen, the, the foot plants, but the athlete's moving forward, the heel doesn't lift, and the tibia goes forward, it goes, and that's what tears ACL. Um, I, had allow... that, I had that experience. I had a bucket handle tear of my medial meniscus, yeah, yeah. and I was wearing a standard, and unfortunately, I didn't wear like a low stud. I was wearing your classic Adidas, you know, seven or eight studs. Yeah. And it was, in, in Virginia here, it's very, uh, humid in the summer, but it, it also dried out the, the clay that we have. And so we were playing uh, not on turf, but on natural grass. It was very dry, very grabby as it turned out, because you, you put your foot down on that, that dry clay and it just hung for a second. And it was a loose ball and I was just made a kind of a hyper extension forward and boom, mm. there. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's, exactly, that's felt, exactly how it happened. That's yeah. exactly how it happened. So um, I, I think the real kick to it, or the, the advantage to it, is that if you let the ray plantar flex, there's a, there's a concept that your listeners should look up online called the four-bar mechanism. Four-bar is the simplest machine in mechanical engineering that allows for motion and support at the same time. And just you can Google it. It's real easy to find. And watch the videos of it. The, what it requires is that, that all the joints of the mechanism hinge. And so if you don't have range of motion, you don't have the effect. And the foot works exactly like that. But if you take away the MTP joint, you're going to alter everything else. One of the other comments Hicks made in his articles, his four-part series on the mechanics of the foot is brilliant, short, simple, and so on point even to this day. Um, that, that um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say now. I got carried away with Hicks. We were again, um, the, f the four, the four, yeah, yeah, uh, the four bar. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but he, he t says that every joint, I got it, every joint in the foot moves in the opposite direction to the joints that are directly adjacent to it, every one. And so when one doesn't work, the next one is going to move in the wrong direction at the wrong time. That's why I see pronation as a second half issue, not a first half issue of the step. I mean, we know late mid stance pronation is the pathologic pronation. When does it happen? In the second half of the step. 
Does it relate to contact pronation? Not really. Jim Ganley, who was a podiatrist in, at the Pennsylvania College, and a man I really respected, he was very thoughtful and very smart. And he had done dissections on severely pronated children who died and he worked at a, um, you know, at, a, at a hospital that took care of these kids. And he would do dissections at, at, you know, at, at postmortems. And he found that the calcaneus cannot be burnt beyond zero. I heard him say that the first time I went, what? He said, the calcaneus cannot evert beyond zero. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Unfortunately, he's deceased now. He's a great guy. And so what we're seeing is something, pronation is coming from somewhere else. It's not coming from the calcaneus everting. Looks like that, but it's not happening. And so where is it happening? Well, if you lock the MTP joint, and this is the foot, it's starting to trying to rise up, but it can't hinge, you get that, not that. And, and the range of motion is, the, the power to move you is coming from the opposite limb. You're being pulled forward to run and walk. That's how it works. And so the power is coming down and the response is heel lift and toe joint dorsiflexion. Well, if that doesn't happen, what's going to happen instead? The joints have to bend backwards from the way they're supposed to move, according to Hicks's thesis. And that's what you see in pronation. You know, it's interesting because one of the big things with uh, power sprinters and just running in general is this idea of action reaction. And when you look at um, how sprinters are coached, it's even getting their pecs forward. I have uh, a colleague of mine, Tommy Nohilly, he was, a, he was, um, he did steeplechase. He was almost, he was uh, in the Pan Am games and just always was like two hundredths of a second away from being on the Olympic team, his, his two, uh, his two trials. But he, because of his running background and coaching, he emphasizes, you know, that action reaction, arm forward and, yeah. and hips back. So that's interesting too. And, and I think that has a lot to do with uh, what, you, what you just spoke about. Oh yeah, there's a lot. So there's a guy named Serge Grekovetsky who was a physicist who was from Montreal. And he, um, he described something called the spinal engine. Are you familiar with that? Have you ever heard of that? Yes, yes. I just oh, saw that article this morning. Well, it's not, it's a book. And, and what he did was he talked about how the, the shoulders and the pelvis counter rotate to one another. And so you store energy in the spine and they return it. And that return is timed with the action of the opposite leg kicking forward. It's a very integrated system. And so you, you're, you're, that energy that moves you is, is, is the whole body moving you. And arm swing is very, very important in that process. In fact, one of the tricks that I've learned over my career is that when you're trying to, to understand whether somebody has a lug length discrepancy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah heard it. It. Well, yeah. I said our article, but this is, yeah. uh, if I can get it framed, that's, yeah, yeah. that's basically yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, yeah. It's, and it goes the other way. It goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. And, and um, the, um, the, the storage and return of energy is so critical in that process that when you time it right, you're going to get efficient gait. But the more you distime it, and the more these joints are moving the wrong direction, now you have a process that's that's energy inefficient. So that's where it comes from. And by not watching the sagittal plane every day when you watch people walk, you miss the elegance of what's happening. It's pretty incredible, actually. Yeah, I'm I'm having a biomechanics summit, and I hope you can you could check it out. But but uh, Richard Blake, whom I'm sure you know quite well, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. is also a big guy about talking about looking, you know, from head to toe and looking at the back segments, etc. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about how these interventions actually help us, and I want to start first very simply. Even when I put something like this, which I referenced before for my own functional hallux limitus. What I notice is that although it may not actually increase first ray dorsiflexion for me when I when I when I'm just standing weight bearing, and you know because they talk about theoretically if your subtalar is neutral, you, you might even get a little bit more extension uh, in your yep. first ray. But what I do notice is that when I wear it, my joint feels better. So this may be related to 
the thing that you talked about when you were uh, driving home that day with that patient that, that was avoiding, yeah. Yeah. It, it may be related to that phenomena. And so my contention is that even if we don't truly increase motion that much, there's something in the reorientation and the and the support and how we have things in synchronicity that takes force away from that that um, dysfunctional well, part. So I, I'm giving a talk this year at the that's probably my ninth or tenth time at the Schuster meeting in New York at the New York College, um, and this talk is about four foot inversion as a precursor to chronic pronation, and that that what happens is that I mean, it, th there was an article that showed that when you invert the rear foot, you increase dorsiflexion. And, and so leaning back to that story I told you about the woman with the painful leg, I mean, she used her anterior tibial muscle to do it, which was kind of ineffective because that's a swing phase muscle, not a stance phase muscle. She used it during stance phase and it gave her pain. So, but inversion is clearly a way to dorsiflex the toe joint. Is it the most effective way to dorsiflex the toe joint is really should be the question. Because it, is it, are you, are, by adding a rear foot orthotic, rear foot posted orthotic, are you, are you treating the problem or are you enhancing the compensation for the problem? And that's, the thesis, that's what I'm talking about in, in New York. Um, and and I, I think that it's an interesting way to look at it because I think that rear foot pronation is not, like I said, Ganley said, it doesn't happen. So I'm not sure what we're doing, but I think that we are inverting the foot. I've measured, I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of in-shoe pressure analysis over the years of work. And what I would do is I would make a test orthotic, have somebody walk, watch what it did, and then make an adjustment and watch what it did again. And repeated that until I got the right kind of curve shapes to, to, to make an effective orthotic. And that was really the, the secret of my, my, my outcome success was measuring what I did and looking at it and seeing what's the outcome. And, and excessive rear foot posting was just not what it, it didn't do what everybody said it did it, it inverted the foot that it did but it didn't change the dynamics enough when you use less rear foot posting but a small amount one or two degrees versus and then added a first rate cutout the dynamics changed entirely and that's really one of the main in, ingredients in getting people better for long term is, is getting that joint moving and getting the other joints moving as well that's why podiatrists know that making orthotic you know, shell that extends beyond the med heads is not a good idea. You got to keep it behind the med heads because they need to dorsiflex. And as soon as you stick something under them, you're going to push them up. And that's not what you want to do. What are your thoughts on this idea of extraceptors, uh, proprioceptive things that are inside orthotics, even in so-called, and I'll just show an example, yeah. uh, these little two point discriminatory things that are in these recovery things. They certainly feel good. I just wanted yeah. to get your thoughts on the proprioceptive input to the foot and how you, through your years and what your experiences have been uh, with that. Obviously not a lot of good research on this. The only no. thing we know is that two or three millimeters is the point of tactile discrimination. That much we do know so from neuropathy there was a studies. Guy, there was a guy at Concordia University. Uh, his name escapes me at the moment. This, public, this was published in the late eighties long time ago, who said that cushion shoes anesthetize feet. That was his comment. He did a study over the summer in Montreal where he had people run barefoot versus with shoes on and found that the arch went up. Now, I, I'm, I'm not supporting barefoot running concepts. That's not what I'm doing. But the idea that too much cushioning is probably a negative is probably accurate. I, I, I think too much of that is no good. You want to feel where you are and you want to feel where the ground is. So if this enhances that, that's fine with me. I, I, I see that as a positive. Have you used any tactile things in your practice or that's not been something that you've really not, highlighted? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. but let's, I, move on. let's move on to something that's also, I know, a, a big thing that you've done over the years. Um, and I know it's kind of a lost art. I, I, there's not a lot of practices that do manipulation, but talk a little yeah. bit because I know that's sure. a big part of what you yeah. did. Yeah, so I, I went to a meeting um, in uh, Colorado and Denver a long time ago, and I didn't even know that lower extraordinary manipulation existed. I, I just didn't know anything about it. And there were some osteopaths 
doing lower extremity manipulations. And I went, what's that? And I watched and I, it wasn't really, I didn't think they were that good at it, but um, in hindsight, but they, you know, sort of introduced me to the concept. And then over the years, I met a bunch of different people. I was introduced to people who were very good at it. Um, and I learned manipulation. The best one was a guy named um, uh, Paul Keneally from Australia. He was a physician. And he introduced me to how to do things gently. At any rate, what I said before about the joints have to move for this all to work. Well, if the joint is restricted, the one just adjacent to it is going to have to take up the motion. That's why chiropractic manipulation of the spine is effective because the joints that don't move are the ones that are causing the, the adjacent ones to move incorrectly. And now you have issues associated with that. And so manipulation is a very, very valuable tool that is so rewarding to practice. Ankles, cuboids, MTP joints, the midfoot. Um, you, it's an instant thing. I don't need any tools but my fingers. Um, and you can change the dynamics of range of motion almost immediately. Um, the, one of the best ways of handling it is ankle sprain. Um, as long as nothing's broken and there's ways to examine for that, you can tell that on a field pretty much, um, that you can mobilize the ankle joint and mobilize the cuboid and they'll stand up and go, what did you do? Why is it gone? There's no pain. And it changes the dynamics. The other thing that happens is when the fibula, because when you, when, when your ankle doesn't dorsiflex, you have aquinas even. The fibula translates normally during walking. It moves cranially and laterally. And when it moves up and out, what it does is it expands the ankle mortise because the, the tailored dome is wider anteriorly than posteriorly. So for the ankle to dorsiflex and for it to glide back into the joint, the fibula has to move to give it that range of motion. And say after doing thousands of these, um, I, I'll tell you that Aquinas, if you manipulate it, it goes away immediately. But what also happens is that when the fibula doesn't translate, the fibula head is the origin of the perineus longus. And the perineus longus is a pronator of the foot. So it resists inversion of the posterior tibia. And when the, when the perineals are inhibited, the foot becomes inverted. You get hallux luminous. Um, and, and you feel unsteady. And so after an ankle sprain, one of the things that patients will say is, I feel like I'm going to sprain it again. It's so unsteady, I can't seem to get my inside of my foot on the ground. I feel like I'm going to roll it over and over again. Every step, I hit a little pebble, I'm going to go over. And that's because you've lost the muscle balance between posterior tibial and perineals. They crisscross under the foot to squeeze the midfoot together to give you balance to inversion, eversion. And so once the perineals become inhibited, now you've lost that, the foot's inverted, so it's walking on a knife edge, ready to turn again, and you can resolve that uh, almost instantly. Um, I have some of these manipulations are on YouTube. Um, just search Dannenberg and manipulation. It's D-A-N-A-N-B-E-R-G on manipulation. And you'll find them, and they're relatively easy to perform. Um, they're very safe. I've never heard anybody as far as I know. And, um, and the re results are instantaneous. That's what's so incredible about them. And the other interesting story that I have about that was a woman came into me with four years of heel pain because she was told she had plantar fasciitis. Four years. She had, had half a dozen cortisone injections. She hurt all the time. She was miserable. And I examined her and I examined her from the bottom. And the plantar fascia wasn't painful. What was painful was above the plantar fascia into the abductor hallucis muscle belly. That's where the pain was. I looked at her, and sure enough, the calcaneal cuboid joint had no range of motion. I adjusted that, and she stood up, and the pain was instantaneously resolved. So much so that I began to look for that a lot with plantar fascia pain, and it's really incredible to do. The manipulation could be done very gently. The cuboid whip was the one that people used to do, but and they still do. Um, but that's that's pretty violent, actually, if you ask me. It's a very gentle way to do it, and that's what the video is about. And, and it's just the key is to, to invert the foot very gradually while you press onto the cuboid and feel the release that happens. And then once you get that, then you can adjust it. It's like walking through a door that's closed versus walking through a door that's open. You know, closed doors don't work. You got to open them. I did take a look at your a couple of those videos, and I would just say that I think it would be better for a practitioner, a physical therapist, podiatrist, athletic trainer, somebody that's got some... Uh, yeah 
experience with anatomy versus just somebody coming on who uh, oh, yeah, doesn't absolutely. have the experience with the anatomy to attempt these yeah. uh, on yourself. I, 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 I can't do it to me. I don't know how to do it. So you yeah, well, it. you don't have the leverage either, right? No. Uh, as far as what your experiences have been, and this is an important one in terms of uh, not only personal training and, and, and getting adept at it, but uh, falling back into dysfunction, what in your practice did you find the time frame that these things would uh, last uh, before they might need? Uh, it, it, it depends another? on the... It depends on the nature of the problem. So there are people who walk along, step in a hole, roll their ankle, and you treat that, it goes away. They never had a problem before, and it goes away, and that's it. And I don't know how, you know, it's just they never had a problem before until they hurt themselves. So that's one group. The other group sort of walk themselves into it. And that's when you make the right foot orthotic and make that and, and get that effectively treated. And then you can solve it long term do people occasionally need manipulation yeah i mean everybody needs manipulation once in a while i mean you know my wife and i i taught her how to do these she does mine every now and then you know and i mean i'm i ski and i run i run i run pretty slow there are sometimes i live in stowe vermont which is a very um physically active community and there are women that sometimes like race walk by me when i'm running so i <laughs> it's a bit humiliating but it's fine. Well, yeah you, ha you have a beautiful ski you have a beautiful ski resort uh, we sure do we sure yeah. do. It's great. Well, wrap, wrapping up, I want to I want to yep. give you a chance to say a couple things. But one is we certainly uh, rest on the shoulders of our predecessors. And you've mentioned if, uh, a couple. Are there is there one in particular uh, hmm. that influenced you? And, and what was that influence in terms of things that you learned? Um, well, Shelly Langer and Joe Wernick from Langer Labs were very influential for me for very different reasons. Um, Shelley was um, a very insightful guy who saw the orthotic business growing and created a business. And Joe was the more biomechanical guy who understood that. And I bounced a lot of ideas off of them over the years and I found them invaluably helpful. And, um, you know, I, guys like Joe D'Amico in New York who have been very supportive of me and have invited me back to Schuster meeting year after year um, I, I really appreciate that and, and find them very valuable. And the other was a guy named Kevin Heron, who was a chiropractor in Boise, Idaho, who um, taught me a lot about manipulation. And I, those were the guys that really changed me to, and then I changed my life. What would be your parting thoughts for students that want to become more adept with biomechanics other than uh reading and and watching videos of what we've just yep. discussed anything else that you'd like to add yeah i would say something that i think is kind of interesting so a long time ago i learned this lesson that when you say aha i've got it you have shut off your mind to all the other possibilities that may exist but if instead you say ah oh, that's one way you've opened your mind up to all the other possibilities that exist and you will find many more things that happen in a, um, uh, you know, in, in a way to understand what it is that you're looking to solve and other tools that you will develop to treat patients who need it. And that's my advice. I like that thought. Kind of echoes uh, another colleague of mine, a little closer to, uh, to my generation, Luke Ciccinelli. He has this thing, N equals one, where we <laughs> treat patients one at a time and uh, one at a time. Based, based on our experiences as well. Yeah. There you go. Well, the, 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 the time went over what we thought, but yep. uh, I think it's all good stuff. And thank yeah, you so much for uh, doing this on a Sunday afternoon. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me. Have a great day. And just text me when it's going to be aired, okay? Of course. Thank you. See you, Ben. Take care.